Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Okay, okay. I'm actually glad that you responded the way you did at first because it ties into my message. Uh, on the way here, I was listening to Jaira, you know, worshiping to that song, and I just, I knew that God was all over this song when our worship team sang it today because it connects to my message. There's a line uh, in the song, I don't want to mess it up. Um, on the mountain top, I see everything so clearly now. So that's, that's the whole point of my message today. In the last two weeks, I've never wrestled with God more than I have. Has anyone ever been in that place uh, where my brain and my heart were fighting? And I had a short temper. The whole, you know, I was short tempered towards my kids, towards my husband. I was stressed out and I couldn't pinpoint to what exactly it was. Like I knew uh, that preaching sometimes can, can feel like a battle, especially preparing for the message, because there's just so many things that uh, you have to think about and that you want to cover. You always want to make sure that you speak the truth, that you don't take scriptures out of context and things like that. So it can be a lot of pressure to prepare a message for a Sunday. But for some reason in the last two weeks, it has been the hardest that it's ever been for me, maybe because it's the topic of the message. I love this sermon series, and I really appreciate it because it's given me an opportunity to think outside of my comfort zone and ask myself a question, God, what are you teaching me in this specific season? What is it that you're showing me? And I saw God show, God showed me this picture of the kingdom of God. And specifically, it's a picture of a party because the kingdom of God is a party. I mean, how can you not celebrate your permanent identity, your permanent residency, your placement in the kingdom of God? No matter where you go, it's always with you. It's, it's not necessarily a physical location where you can go. It doesn't have borders because borders tend to be exclusive. But it's a place where no matter where you are, the kingdom is too. That's worthy of celebration. We sing songs, we worship, which by the way, worship, I find worship to be therapy, to be honest. Your soul just needs it. We worship, we sing some songs, we raise our hands, we get challenged by our pastor, and then we're still dead inside. Why is that? Why is it that when we walk away from a fulfilling, hope-filled message, nothing seems to change in our life? How can you celebrate the kingdom of God when your life is falling apart? When you're facing the most difficult seasons that you probably have in your entire adult life. The whole world seems to be falling apart, right? Check out the news. I mean, we've got, I just don't, you know, I want to make sure that I don't miss anything that's going on in the world. Let's see. We've got hurricanes destroying countries. We've got COVID changed our entire life, sweeping across every single country in the world killing so many innocent people. We've got wildfires, wiping out states, displacing people. We've got major physical conflict in the world. United States leaving Afghanistan, the Taliban, the Taliban taking over. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So no wonder we can sing some songs, listen to a sermon, walk away, and, and when we see so much destruction happening in the world, there is no time for celebration. There's only time for stress and feeling like the whole world is going down and I'm going down with it. And that's what I've been battling with for the last several weeks is how can I possibly celebrate anything when all I see is bad? I know in my head and the truth is that the kingdom only knows expansion. It doesn't, it doesn't go backwards. It only goes forward. But I'm struggling to see it. And I've just been wrestling with God. I'm like, God, show me your goodness once again, like you always have. Show me how you're working in the world. And that's, that's the message that I have for you today. That's something that God has been challenging me with. To recognize his presence in the unlikeliest places. And not only understand that he is with me, but also see his actual work. We know that God is powerful and that he does things outside of the natural world, right? That he functions in the supernatural. And that's what I wanted to see. I'm like, God, show me, show me exactly what you're doing because I only see the bad. When I, you know, look at Facebook, and actually I deleted Facebook off my phone. It's probably been the best thing that I've ever done in my entire adult life. That's, you know, a side note. 
But when you look up the news, Fox, CNN, BBC, MSNBC, it doesn't matter where you go, right? There's only the bad. We only see the bad that's going on. And when we fill our minds with all the bad news, it doesn't leave any room for any good news. And that's what God has been challenging me with, with to look at things from a different perspective. Recently, I got the privilege to go to Guatemala. I don't know if you've been. Um, I, know, I see a couple of faces and because, you know, you've been with me, and I've loved it. I've loved spending time with those of you that got to go this year. But going to Guatemala was one of the most privileging, if that's a word, stick with me, hardest, most rewarding, stressful, identity changing, personality shifting, beautiful, hardest experiences of my entire life. And we've only been there for, we were only there for six days. So I went through like a metamorphosis of changes in Guatemala. And it was beautiful, but it was hard. I got to see poverty unlike I have ever seen. And I was born in a third world country. Guatemala is just on a different level of poverty. I got to see destruction. I got to see people struggling in their everyday life. I got to see the circumstances that the widows, older uh, people in Guatemala get rescued out of. I got to see what they lived in. Hearing the stories of the kiddos in the orphanage that get rescued out of the most awful circumstances, that, that was just so hard for me. On the first day when we got there, uh, when we got to meet the kids, we pulled, we pulled up in our vans and the kids run out towards us. Everyone is rushing out of the vans and I was sitting next to Jenny Stumler and I just like grasped her hand. I was like, I can't get out of the car. I was, look, seeing all those kids just brought me back to like my days at the orphanage and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, like, I want to go back. I felt like, in a way, like a failure because I couldn't, I couldn't get out. I, I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't socialize and talk because I was just so struck. But all, looking, looking at all their faces was just, like I said, it was just so hard. But as my time went on in Guatemala, I quickly began to see what God exactly, you know, has been doing. These kids get rescued out of the worst circumstances. I mean, we're talking sex trafficking sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse by family members. And these kids are laughing and they're smiling. They're getting loved on by the people who work at the orphanage. And, and it was such a healing experience for me because my tongue doesn't even, like I can't even like say that they're orphans. They're not. That's not, that's not their identity and you can see it. By day two, I was so much better. I was doing so much better emotionally and physically. Like my body wasn't stressed anymore because I could see, I could see God working in every single one of those kids' hearts, changing their identity from I am not wanted, I am garbage, to I am worthy, and God has come after me. God has deemed me worthy to save me. I am a son, I am a daughter, and that's what I got to see in Guatemala. Uh, also, the same ministry that Shanik was talking about earlier, they also have a program where they adopt widows in the community. And these widows are men and women um, at their super old age that live, shack would be, a shack would be a, 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 like a kind word to describe their living conditions, but they get rescued out of these dire circumstances and situations. And the ministry raises money to build homes for these widows. And they don't stop there. They build homes and they also, on the monthly basis, provide support, Finan uh, not, uh, not necessarily financial support, but they provide them with food and they provide them with medicine. So they don't just provide them with housing, but they also provide them with the community. So I got to see that. And it was such a, like I said, it was such a wonderful experience. When I first got there to when I left, when I first got there, I was thinking, God, these are your people. You love them. I can see you love Guatemala just by how he created it. It is one of the most beautiful countries he, I, I can see God's love for the people in Guatemala, but I just couldn't help but ask, where are you, God, in, the, in, the, like in this moment? Where are you? These people, they need you. They need you more than me. They need you more than most Americans need you. Where are you for them? 
he wasn't shy. He began to answer to me where he was and what he was doing. Let me give you a couple of examples to bring the same orphanage into the conversation. So as you drive on the highway to get to the orphanage, so at one point when you get there, or when you, uh, when you pull closer to it, you see it on the left, right, on the mountain top. So uh, several large buildings visible from the highway, and you see the orphanage. And I love, that, I love that beautiful picture because as you pull on the highway, you are in the valley, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. So you are in the valley. You're driving through the valley, and you see the worst of the worst. And then all of a sudden, when the bus or the van turns, you see the orphanage pop up in the middle of nowhere on the mountain top. And it was just such a beautiful imagery for me in that moment. It was so healing because I saw God's goodness and his divine appointment for every single child in that orphanage. There's a mountaintop, then there is a ginormous valley where most people live in that area. And then moving into the next mountaintop where the orphanage is. I saw God delivering kids from the valley, literally and spiritually, right? Delivering them to the mountaintop. I wish you were there with me so you could experience the magnitude of that healing process for me. My heart was aching for the people and I felt bad for them. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing that not only is God present in Guatemala, but he is working and he's working hard and he is winning. Like he is not just some cripply old gentleman sitting on a throne somewhere far, far away. He's not judging people for their lifestyle. No, God is too busy working and not judging people, okay? He is too busy working, and I saw his beauty. Seeing those widows, my goodness, we got to meet a couple of them. Uh, we uh, took a, a trip to meet like three different widows, and we also worked with one for the whole week because uh, our church raised the money to build a home for one of them, and that's what we were doing all week. And it was just such a, such a cool experience because, once again, talking about the valley. The, widows, the widow whose home we built, her home is on the mountaintop overlooking the valley and another mountaintop, another village. So there she was her entire life living in the valley of that local village in the most awful circumstances that you can envision a human life could, that you cannot believe that humans could survive in those conditions feels forgotten and alone most of her life. That's something that she shared with us is that she always struggled with feeling alone. She had no one, no family, feels forgotten by her community. And then the ministry sweeps in. They show her the love of Christ. She's in this valley. And then she gets rescued. And now she has a beautiful yellow home on the mountaintop on the other side of the valley. That was another beautiful imagery that God showed me of how he delivers people, that he never forsakes people. I know that David, right, from the Bible, King David, can definitely connect with being in the valley, right, because he writes about that in Psalm 23, 4, and I think, I can, uh, I think it's on there. It, it can be pulled up. And I know all of y'all know this verse. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Okay, let's scratch the second part of the verse, okay? D don't go there. Go to the, uh, to the first part. That's where we're going to focus. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is what I've been struggling with this whole, this whole week, or actually this whole month. Walking in the, being in the valley, either physically or emotionally, I know that you can connect with me in this moment because I believe that prophetically in this week, I have felt every single one of your pain. I feel it right now. I see it. I, I am experiencing it. And I've just been praying, praying through it with God, wrestling with him. I'm like, how can I, what can I possibly say? What can you possibly say and do to a, to a person who is struggling to survive, 
to thrive, to do anything. How can, how can I tell the people that, woo, let's celebrate the kingdom of God is so good. Yes, let's go eat lunch and forget this ever happened. And then you go on through your life and you are feeling miserable inside. You feel forgotten by God. You feel, you feel nothing like what, what, what we sing about God conquering uh, all of your enemies and, you know, giving you the power to, to thrive. What happens when you find out your loved one has cancer or when your loved one is struggling with COVID or a different disease, a different addiction? It doesn't matter. But I have felt your pain this week and I want, you to, I want to let you know that. And I think God allowed me to feel your pain like he brought it to me, to my attention because he wanted me to let you know that he is feeling it with you right now. Like he is walking in the valley with you. David was, he has a lot of, in, in a, like learning about him from scriptures, David was awesome. But David also did a lot of messed up stuff. And yet, God never abandoned him. And this was pre-Jesus. God had God never abandoned David, even for the things that he has committed. Because David is wise enough to finish out that scripture. And that's the second part of that verse um, in Psalm can we pull it up one more time? So I will fear no evil. I'm, I'm in the middle of the most awful season of my life, but I will not be afraid because you are with me. That's awesome. So knowing that God is with you right now is amazing enough. We could have ended it right there, but he doesn't stop there. He says something else that's very much profound. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That tells me that is not only is God is in the valley with me, he's walking with me, but he's also on a mission. He is on the mission to change my circumstances. The point of the rod, right, and the staff, that means that the person, right, who is responsible for the sheep, the shepherd, they're on the job. They're not vacationing. They're not there for emotional support. They're not your cheerleader with pom-pom saying, you got this, I'll cheer for you from afar. You know, when you're, running that, when you're running a race, like if you're like uh, in the mini marathon, I did it once, never do it, we'll never do it again. Actually did it twice, we'll never do it again. So watching those people on the side hanging out cups of uh, Gatorade, you know? Oh, I wanted to say a lot of bad words to those people in the moment. I'm running and they're smiling with their Gatorade cups. Here, take this, okay? I'm there with you. So this is kind of like comparing it to the scripture, right? Where... Uh, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, running a mini marathon feels like that, um, right? I will fear no evil for you are with me. So there are supporters, they're handing out cups for you. Well, that's good. Okay, so quench my thirst or, you know, make me vomit with the Gatorade. That's fine. But that doesn't really help me. Somebody bring me a wheelchair. Uh, somebody get me some, some skates. I don't know what, what you can, a bicycle, right? A motorcycle even better so I don't have to move my feet. Like, support me and make, help me change my circumstances. And that's where God is doing. That's what he's doing all over the world. He is not only handing out Gatorade to people, right, with his presence. No, but he also is on the mission. And his mission is to deliver you to the mountaintop from your current valley. Amen. Not only is he with you, but he is for you. Yeah. He will deliver you even when you don't have faith in yourself. It's a good thing that God does not rely on your faith. I'm just saying my whole life I was, you know, kind of taught that, you know, like you need faith. Like God needs your faith in order to move and whatever. That's all fine and dandy. But let me tell you, there were plenty of times in my life where I've had no faith. And God has delivered me unlike any other time in my life. He does it out of the joy so he can turn at me and say, I'll do it again. Yeah. I'll do it again. I'll do it a thousand times over. You are my daughter. I'll do it for you a thousand times. And then some. And that's what I saw. The question that I had for, you, for God in this season is, where are you when, when my life is falling apart? Where are you when your sons and daughters are crying out to you? The whole world, to me right now, feels like it is in that valley of the shadow of death, right? The whole world feels to be in that place. We only hear the bad news. So when we hear only the bad news, 
How can we focus on the good? We don't focus on that second part, the fact that God is right there with equipment to fix your circumstances. On Friday, our, la our last day in Guatemala, I am not going to cry. That's probably, that's a preface for probably I'm gonna cry. I hate crying on stage. So on Friday, it was a moment um, where we got to dedicate the home that we built for the widow. In that whole week, we had little kids from the village working with us, having fun with us, just a bunch of random kiddos, and I taught them paint the house yellow because they wanted to learn English. And so they would be chanting on the streets, paint the house yellow, paint the house yellow. And so as, after we've painted that house yellow, after we've stained all, you know, all the windows and doors and we uh, finished everything that we needed to, uh, to do for the widow, the, the ministry also supplies the widow with furniture for her house. So the, during the moment of dedication, she walks around from room to room to see everything that she has now. Well, Bethany, the lady in charge of the ministry, the day before, tells the widow, hey, don't go to the house until it's all ready. And during the dedication time, when everyone is here, we'll show you the house. The widow's like, mm -hmm, sure, sure. Bethany leaves. The widow comes up from her little shack while she was staying. And she starts looking a day early, right, when we were setting everything up. And I was, and I just kind of just, it was an awesome moment. It was a, a divine moment. It was such a private moment without any, uh, without the crowd being there to watch her. I just got to watch her process through this information as she, you know, was seeing what she got. So she goes into one room. She looks, there is a bed with bedding and a pillow. She goes, I've never had a bed like this before in my life. She turns, there is a dresser, and there is like a, a beautiful mirror in the dresser. She looks, she goes, I've never had a mirror like this before. She said, like in Spanish, she goes, I had this little cracked little mirror. She goes, this is what I look like? She goes into another room because there's two little bedrooms and a kitchen and a little uh, living room in the middle. She goes into another bedroom, same thing, same setup. And she's amazed. She goes, I, have, I get two bedrooms? I'm like, yeah, so someone can come and stay with you because she's battling with loneliness. And now it's inviting for someone to come in. She goes in the middle and she looks, she goes, what is this? And Shannon and, and our translator, they explained to her that it's a stove. And she's like, I need a hole in the ceiling so the smoke can come up. And Shannon is trying to explain to her, no, no, no. This is like a really cool stove where it won't smoke your entire house. And she's like, wow. And then, you know, she's like kind of playing with it and seeing how it works. She's seen all the plates that they brought and like all the storage that she has. And she was just amazed. And, uh, you know, I'm weeping in the back, trying to make myself look invisible because I've lost it, right? I'm like, <laughs> you know, trying not to make a, like, a scene, but I'm struggling to keep, hold it together. I'm like, just hold it together, hold it together. And when we left, this was Thursday night, when we left, this was right before the dedication, I just felt such a burden in my heart because... We're there, that's fine, and she's getting so many people visiting her, like she's so happy, but what happens when we leave and she's alone again? That's what I struggled with, like what happens when she's alone on that mountaintop in her house? On Friday, God answers my question too in that moment because during the dedication when Bethany, the person in charge of the ministry, when she's walking the widow and the widow's pretending like she never saw anything, right? Oh, I see Jesus. Oh, my goodness. It was the first time that, like, I saw him in the present time, like, in his body. Because right before I lifted my, uh, my eyes, we were worshiping to one song before, and I, was and I was like, God, show me where you are right now. And I looked down, and he's right there. His hand is on the widow's back, and he's following her from room to room, smiling, 
And he's just so excited for her because she is excited too. And then she prayed for everyone. Then she started praying. And, and Jesus is touching her the whole time. And I know that uh, Sean, if, I don't know if you guys have met Sean and Inga before, but Sean was there and he, he uh, you know, asked her to pray. And when she started to pray, I'm seeing God holding on to her. And every word that she said in her prayer was going to come alive, was going to come true. God was blessing her in that moment. And he told me, Jesus told me something at the end. He said, you are leaving, but I'm not. I'm staying right here. When she wakes up in the morning, I'll be here. When she goes to bed at night, I'll be here. I'll be in, an, in the other room. I am her permanent guest. I am not leaving. And just like that widow, God has not left you. If he has not forgotten her in the middle of nowhere in Guatemala, Floyd's Knobs has a lot of hills too. God hasn't forgotten you. He has a divine purpose for you. He is walking next to you in your valley of your circumstances. He's, and he's got proper equipment. He will deliver you from your circumstances. And that is what he sent me to tell you. He will deliver you from your circumstances. Wherever you are in your valley, God has a way to provide for you. This past week, as I was praying through the sermon, God gave me a super small scripture, and I will give it to you. So if you want to write it down, I didn't have any points for you today, but I do want you to write down this particular scripture. It's very small, uh, very, you can memorize it probably today at lunch. Challenge your family to do it. So the scriptures can be found in Psalm 104.10. And it's very simple, okay? And I'll, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. Very small, right? Easily skipped. It's not one of the most famous ones in, you know, in the Bible. But this one, just God ministered so much to me through this scripture. And here's why. I just, I love the wording. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. This whole message is about God delivering you from the valley. A physical one. A spiritual one, right? Speaking metaphorically. So he's got proper equipment to get you out of your circumstances and do it well. Because God doesn't lose and he doesn't do things average. He is excellent. So not only does he have proper equipment to do it, but he also finds a way to provide for you while you are in the valley. God oftentimes being compared to the living water. I love this scripture that he will make springs gush forth for you. What is a spring? It's a fresh water, refreshing, right? It gives you hope. He's, he's unending mercy, his grace, his healing, his presence. Those are the springs that gush. He makes them gush forth for you. He makes a way to deliver you out of your circumstances, but he also Make sure that you are healthy. That's how good he is. Bringing proper equipment to the fight and bringing you supplies to sustain you through the fight. You are not alone. You are on the winning team always. I love this scripture. I love what God is doing in Guatemala. He loves Guatemala. It's evident in everything that he does. He's doing so many good things there. Like an, another example of what he's doing, he works, so there's a clinic at the orphanage, and they have full-time doctors on staff, which is amazing. So they service the kiddos in the clinic that come, again, from the worst circumstances, but also they've opened up the clinic to the local community who has no access to any type of medicine, and now they can come and be serviced at the clinic. I just saw God working everywhere. Our hotel, 
Another example of springs gushing forth in the valley, our hotel that we stayed in in Antigua, Guatemala, beautiful hotel. So every team that comes for the mission, they stay there. The money that the hotel gets from the people who stay there provides so many jobs to the people from the local community. That's God providing springs to people, that living water. And looking at the map of the world, okay, so I want you to envision the map of the world. God is doing the same thing in every single country in this world. There isn't a country that he is not working in. Recently, I've been praying over uh, a couple of countries that have been weighing on my heart. I teach government and economics to a, a bunch of 12th graders. And talking about politics is something that we do regularly in class. And so I just try to keep up with what's going on in all these different countries to stay informed. And my heart has been so heavy for Afghanistan, Haiti, Yemen, Somalia, all these countries that are in the, you know, we might not even know about them, but God does. And he's put, that, put those countries on my heart to pray. And I wanted to finish out what I was going to say with this. So Psalm 104, uh, yeah, 104, 10, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. This is how God does it in 2021. I'll give you little snippets and we'll be done. Let me give you an example. In Afghanistan, there's a, uh, an organization called Sahar Education. They have repaired and rebuilt over 18 schools. They provide literacy classes for girls and women in a country that's against women. They've provided gender equity programs to over 250,000 girls. They have trained over 850 female teachers. That's how, God, that's how God works. He will change this world through education. There are more educated people today than there have ever been, and I am celebrating that as a teacher. In Haiti, recently being struck right with the hurricane and with, uh, with the earthquake. In 2020 alone, an organization called Hope for Haiti have supported over 6,000 students in getting, receiving education at their 24 partner schools. 482 teachers receive salary from this organization so they're able to teach at local schools. They've opened over 37 different computer labs at partnering schools. Support eight farmers with monthly stipends. Distributed 20 million on-hand medical supplies, medication, and PPE to vulnerable Haitians, helping protect against COVID. They have serviced over 102 locations with mobile clinics. They provided over 12.8 million gallons of water to the population and distributed over 11,000 water filtration systems. So what are you doing, God? Quickly becomes, wow, you're busy working, but it's just not getting reported by CNN and Fox. In Yemen, a country ridden with starvation, with conflict and pain, God is seeing something else. He's seeing sons and daughters, and he's delivering them from the valley with proper equipment. He's been, there's a, an organization called care.org, been working there since 1993. They address poverty and promote social justice through emergency relief efforts and sustainable development projects. Reach over 1.2 million people with water, sanitation, and hygiene services, like water and other hygiene kits. Part, they partner with health, or health organizations to, to prevent spread of deadly diseases like COVID-19. They support women's economic empowerment by granting access to financial means, equipment, technical advice, and training so they can set up small businesses. They distribute food, cash, and vouchers to over 1.4 million people on a monthly basis. Last country I wanted to highlight is Somalia. It's another country I've been praying heavily over. I found an organization, it's called Somali Hope Foundation. They have a school there that, uh, that they recently opened up and built. They called it Hope Academy. I love that name, Hope Academy. Uh, last year, they saw their very first graduating class. Half of their girls, so they have about 705 students and half of them are girls. I love that. Education is 100% free for the students, so there is no tuition. They service underprivileged, vulnerable kiddos who are either displaced because of conflict or they are orphans. 
They learn foreign languages. They have a computer lab. They have access to the internet. They're busy learning. I love that. So to the question of God, what are you doing? You are working. You are working and you've never stopped. The world is getting better. It's just not reported on Facebook. The world is getting so much better than it was before. It's just not reported. And that's what I want to let you know. I want to bring hope to your circumstances. I want to bring life to something that feels dead in your life. God is in the valley with you. He is working alongside of you. He's providing you with that necessary getter aid. But he also has equipment to deliver you out of your darkest valley. And that's all I have for you. I'd love to pray over, over you if you let me. I want to maybe prophesy over you for just a minute, just to speak life over you. Is that okay? Jesus, I have felt your sons and daughters' pain. Over the last couple of weeks has been the heaviest experience of my life. And it was the most humbling and rewarding experience of my life because you were, you were able to bring perspective to me unlike any time in my life before. You are, you've shown me and you're showing your sons and daughters in this room where you are in their circumstances and what equipment do you have with you to help them get out of their circumstances. I want you to bring to their attention a specific example of Psalm 104. Those springs gushing forth, show them an example of that in their life. How, what, how are you refreshing them? What are you doing in their life right now, Lord? Bring it to your sons and daughters' attention. You are a good father. You've never abandoned your children. You've walked beside David, and you're walking beside Julia, and every single person in this room. You love them. You've called them victorious. You've called them worthy and strong, unbeatable. You are undefendable. You've placed the kingdom of God inside of them. You've given them a reason to have joy. And we're going to walk out of here celebrating that. You have sent us on the mission to make this world better, and that is what we will do. We will operate from a place of victory, knowing that the battle has been won, knowing that the valleys of people's lives have an end. You will deliver them to the mountaintop like you did the orphans in Guatemala, like you did the widows, and like you're doing to millions of people around the world. We're thankful for, your, for who you are. We're thankful for your good nature. That's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen, Julia. Thank you for that amazing message and reminder that what we focus on is important. Our perspective is important. And are we going to focus on death? Are we going to focus on life and what God is doing and how he's working? Right 2,000 years ago, through the power of the Spirit, Jesus resurrected to life, from death to life. And can I tell you this morning, church, that that process is still going on today. Jesus specializes in making dead things come to life. And so I don't know who that's for this morning. I don't know how that resonates with you. But if you feel that you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, just know that Jesus is with you. He's life and he loves bringing those dead things to life. Whether it's dreams, whether it's desires, man, whether it's pain, Man, right, we serve a God who gives beauty for ashes, joy for sorrow, and he loves doing that for his children. Amen? Amen. Well, hopefully you're encouraged today. We want to invite you back next week as we continue in our Mosaic series. I promise you, you will not want to miss it next Sunday, but until then, just know you are loved, and there's nothing you can do about it. See you next week.